The Appellate Division Fourth Department, based in Rochester, consists of 22 counties in central and western New York, extending from the St. Lawrence River Valley in the north to the Pennsylvania border in the south, and from the Mohawk Valley in the east to Lake Erie in the province of Ontario to the west. It includes the second largest city in the state, Buffalo, as well as the larger cities of Rochester and Syracuse, and the smaller cities of Batavia and Jamestown, and it includes rural farming communities in between. Welcome to Meet Your PJ, a series created and produced by the New York State Judicial Institute. I'm John Carr, Senior Advisor for Strategic and Technical Communications. And today I'll be chatting with Presiding Justice Gerald J. Whalen. Judge Whalen was designated by Governor Andrew M. Cuomo to the Appellate Division Fourth Department on October 1st, 2012, and is Presiding Justice of the, of the Appellate Division on January 7th, 2016. He's a graduate of Kinesis College, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1979. He earned his law degree in 1983 from the State University of New York at Buffalo. Justice Whalen was elected to New York State Supreme Court in 2005. Prior to taking the bench, Judge Whalen was a litigation par partner with Hiscock and Berkeley. He was in private practice for 21 years, handling complex civil and criminal cases before taking the bench. Judge Whalen, thank you so much for your time today. If you could just give me a brief uh, overview, a bird's eye view of the fourth department, what it is, where it is, and what it does. Well, uh, John, you did a, a wonderful job of uh, setting forth the geographic boundaries of the fourth department. We're an intermediate appellate court, which of course means that we're hearing cases that come from the uh, trial level, the Supreme and County courts, that civil cases, criminal cases, family court cases uh, come to us, count a court of claims cases come to us. And so um, we're, we're a court that uh, receives all the uh, court of original jurisdiction cases for appellate review. Um, 90 plus percentage of our cases get resolved in our court and don't go beyond uh, uh, us to the court of appeals. Um, and so we, um, you know, we are essentially a court of last resort for a lot of cases that come before us as, as all the appellate courts are. Um, we um, also, uh, as part of our duties, um, admit uh, lawyers to the practice of law. We do that twice a year in ceremonies, uh, but we also do that on a regular basis on individual applications that come before us that uh, need to be uh, handled uh, more promptly. Uh, in addition to that, we oversee attorney uh, grievance uh, matters uh, uh, that, uh, that come before us. And so um, we're a 12 person court and, uh, and we handle a lot of cases uh, all throughout the year. Thank you for the overview. Now, when you became a judge uh, about 15 years ago, you'd already had a, a full career as a, a litigator. Uh, you were a, a partner at a very large and prestigious law firm. Why did you want to leave that to uh, become a judge? Well, I'll tell you, I had, uh, prior to going with Hiscock and Barkley, which is now the Barkley Damon firm, um, I was with a, uh, I started off uh, as a law clerk uh, uh, in law school with a firm that was very small, very boutique firm in Buffalo. At the time it was called Offerman, Fallon, Mahoney, and Cassano. And um, I received great training there, I had wonderful mentors there. And I didn't know it when I uh, applied to become a law clerk there that uh, it turned out that there turns out to be a, a quite a, a judge making uh, uh, small firm. And so I had the pleasure of practicing uh, initially and learning uh, my trade there as a trial lawyer but also learning under uh, people such as uh, uh, Eugene F. Pickett Jr., who became a uh, appellate division judge, a presiding judge of the fourth department, and also, of course, as you know, a court of appeals uh, judge. And uh, in addition to that, uh, Dave Mahoney, uh, a friend and mentor of mine and partner of mine, uh, became a Supreme Court judge um, in the 8th Judicial District. And uh, Leo Fallon was a member of the fourth department, uh, also, of course, an elected Supreme. And uh, so I had the pleasure of uh, not only having great mentors with that firm, but they were great mentors that had wonderful practices that after a long uh, a career as practicing lawyers decided to make the transition to the court. I saw how that worked as a young lawyer and I saw how, that, how much they enjoyed not only their trial work and the practice they did, but also how much they were renewed and reinvigorated as uh, they became uh, judges and how that became a second act in their careers. 
and uh, and I and I saw that as something very uh, self fulfilling, you know, self fulfillment and a rewarding experience. So I attempted to and was fortunate enough to follow in their footsteps. Mm. Now you you had the benefit as a litigator of appearing before a great many judges and a great many different types of cases in a great many uh, many many different contexts. What in your mind are the qualities as a litigator? What are the qualities of a good judge? What is a what is a good judge in your mind? When I had my when I would put my litigator cap on, I think number one, and it's probably not a surprise to people that tr actually try cases. The number one uh, quality that I liked in a trial judge was uh, a, a good and, and even temperament. Um, there was nothing more disruptive to the ability to handle a case either on a motion or on a trial than to have a judge whose temperament was not even, who, who, who was irascible, who sometimes would uh, go off in the courtroom uh, uh, in ways that just disrupted things. Um, and so I always thought that temperament was a really critical component of a good uh, and, and, and uh, able uh, a judge. In addition to that, I, I think that the real quality of a trial judge, not unlike that an appellate judge, but uh, is to listen. Um, a lot of trial judges come from um, uh, trial lawyers, uh, whether it's a prosecutor or whether it's a civil uh, lawyer. Um, and, and so uh, what, uh, what I found happened in some cases is the, the judge would, at least in the beginning of their career, not leave behind their role as a trial <laughs> attorney and they would engage too much and speak too much uh, in the court process during emotions or during uh, um, the trial. And uh, learning how not to engage, how to listen, and how to respond when necessary, and to control the courtroom when necessary, but to allow the, the lawyers to try their own cases, I thought were, were probably the top qualities of a good trial uh, a judge. That's interesting because I have heard experienced litigators complain, I wish a judge would let me try my case. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're, the, the old saying is, if, if you're gonna try my case, don't lose it. <laughs> Now, what about the calculus for an appellate judge as opposed to a trial judge? Is, is that a different um, skill set, a different demeanor? It, it is. It, it, it draws upon a different skill set, certainly. Uh, obviously, listening is very, very important for uh, it seems a trial judge with an appellate judge. But one of the things that is critical with, I think, the appellate judge's role is the, uh, the ability to work in collaboration with other judges. Very often, uh, well, what happens is the, the trial judges get elevated, right? The elected Supremes get elevated to the appellate court. And, um, and so you're used to being in charge of your courtroom. You're used to being the one who's the, the, the last word on things, uh, ultimately. Um, but when you're in a, in a, in a public setting, you, you, need, you, you uh, need to work with your other judges and collaborate on the, to, to get, reach the final decision. It's not your decision, it's the court's decision. That's a very hard thing I find and have found for new appellate division judges to absorb that yes, you have the ability to concur, yes, you have the ability to dissent, but the decision itself, the majority decision or unanimous decision is a decision of the full court. It's not your decision. And, uh, and you need to be um, a, a responsible partner in coming to that decision. And so I think uh, being able to listen, being able to take into consideration other judges' views on things so that you can reach a consensus, reach a, a majority decision, I think is a really important uh, factor. It's a suppressing of the ego, really, uh, as much as you can. And, uh, and when, you're, when you're dealing with elected uh, Supremes, uh, it, it can sometimes be a, a learning process for, for, um, for new appellate and judges. And it certainly was for me, frankly. Your court has always struck me as a, as a very collegial court, and, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. But before we do that, knowing what you now know, would you, as a judge, would you be different as a litigator? And as an appellate judge, would you be different as a trial judge? Well, I, I'll tell you, I, I've had this conversation with my colleagues on the appellate court here, and, uh, and we all agree that the experience of being on the appellate court uh, is invaluable. Um, it, it would make us such better 
uh, uh, trial attorneys and better trial judges. Um, it, the, the, the idea that you know, we sit and we focus on the record and we comb through the record and we analyze the issues that were before the court and what the, what the rulings were, um, because we can do deep dives into these issues, it, it, to take that and go back to, to be a trial attorney allows you to preserve the record better, protect it better. Um, it to, I was trying cases for a lot of years, 21 years as trial lawyer, um, and certainly I knew to protect the record, um, or at least I thought I did, until I became a trial judge and then I became an appellate division judge. Um, what you learn in, in those roles would, would uh, be very helpful as a trial attorney going back to be able to really protect the record and really understand how it's important to make sure that you are, if you get a judgment, that it's not subject to reversal and set, being sent back, that you can maintain that. And, and that's, a, that's an important skill to acquire. And not all trial lawyers have that. Mm. Do you have a judicial role now, or, or were there mentors that you uh, look up to? Well, well, I would say that, you know, you know people that I did, don't know personally, although I did meet her recently within the last uh, year or so, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, I don't know that we could find a better role model in the court alive today than uh, a Supreme Court Justice Ginsburg. She, she um, when you meet her, it's um, it's almost like an electric uh, <laughs> uh, experience. You know, she she's just so dynamic and she's she's um, so full of energy. Um, it's very it's uh, it's a very special uh, uh, experience. Um, her dedication to the court, her dedication to her craft as a judge, her writings are, are uh, incredibly uh, thoughtful, logical, detailed. Um, it, it, so she would be, I think, um, a role model uh, for me and, and I think for many, many people. Um, and as I mentioned before, though, from people in my life on a regular basis, I had the blessing of Justice Piggott, uh, 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 and Judge Piggott on the Court of Appeals, but then also uh, uh, Leo Fallon and Dave Mahoney, who were personal friends, who were partners, and uh, and they all kind of um, gave me a little, um, not only an insight into being a judge, but also I could see from them their, their abilities, uh, Dave Mahoney's compassion as a judge um, is something that I, that I remember um, very much, uh, Gene Piggott, Judge Piggott's hard work and commitment to every day getting up and doing the job and, and showing up and, and, and being everywhere that he could be to help the bar, to, to, to make sure that his work was always done. Leo Fallon, um, again, one of my former partners and a Supreme Court judge, a Pell Division judge. Uh, Leo's uh, wonderful contribution, I think, for me was take the work seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. And he, he was uh, somebody who it was, all three of these folks were great collegial members of the courts they sat on. Mm. Now, as you uh, mentioned early on, your, your court is, for all intents and purposes, and in most cases, a court of last resort. I don't know what percentage of your cases get to the Court of Appeals, but a very, very small percentage. And unlike the Court of Appeals, you really don't have any control over your calendar. You take everything that comes in the door. Right. Last year... 1,300 of cases came in the door, and you heard oral arguments in 742 of them. Now, how many judges do you have to shoulder this load? We have, uh, we have spots for 12. It's with, in my career in the Fourth Department, it's been very rare for us to have a full complement of judges. Uh, we've always been uh, short uh, one or two. At one point, I think we were short four. Um, and, and so um, it's very unusual for us now to have all 12 judges, and we're very grateful to the governor for making the appointments. Um, it, it, it gives us a full complement of judges. Uh, but the, um, uh, I find it interesting, you know, in, in our court, um, when you're working in an appellate court, every time there's a change, and there were many changes since I've been uh, new to the appellate division, um, there's an addition of a judge, or if there's a couple judges appointed, the court changes. Um, it changes in personality. It changes in how we interact with each other, um, for better or for worse. Um, and uh, and it's, so it's very interesting 
to kind of bring in a new judge, kind of let them know that that dynamic is going to change amongst all the judges, that it's a new court. You know, I'm reading now uh, John Paul Stevens' um, um, book. Uh, it's a ref I think it's called A Reflection of a, a, a Justice. Um, his first 90, I thought it was interesting, his first 94 years um, uh, on the court or in life, I guess. And uh, John Paul Stevens made a comment. He said, he refers to the, the Supreme Court that he sat on by the name of the newest judge to take the court. And so whoever that new judge was, it became their court, as opposed to like the chief judge's court, because the new judge has changed the dynamic of the court, has changed the way the parties, inter the, the judges interact with each other. And uh, I thought that was an interesting way to, to, to look at it. And uh, so if, if I were to do that now, our court would be the Bannister court right now because Tracy Bannister has recently joined us and, uh, and she, she has brought um, with her a lot of energy, um, great experience. She was uh, a former appellate division judge's law clerk, so she was with us before for many years. So she brings that experience to the court. And, and so, yeah, I, f I find it um, you know, an interesting dynamic of the, the way the judges interact with each other. But yes, we have 12 judges and um, they all work very hard and uh, and uh, we keep moving the, the work forward. Now, I know you, I believe you usually sit in, in panels of five, although there have been times when you've been shorthanded and you had to sit in panels of four. How are those panels picked? And is there, is there any conscious effort to make sure that all of the judges at some point sit with all of the other judges so you don't get the same four judges or four or five judges sitting, on, sitting together all of the time? Yeah, I, th I think if you were to look at our panel distribution throughout the time I've been presiding judge, you'd find that it's a it's a it's just a, a it's a, a mix, a constant mix of uh, of judges. There are a couple of things that I, I try to do, and how the panels are, are decided is uh, uh, first of all the panels are constructed without any knowledge of what cases we're going to be assigned to that panel. So the panels are just constructed for purposes of of making sure that we have the right amount of people sitting. Um, and, uh, and I try and make sure you can't always be successful because you do want to keep the mix going amongst the judges. Uh, I want to make sure that if we can, that we have a geographic diversity on the, on the panel. Uh, if there's lawyers appearing from the fifth district or, or the eighth or the seventh, that when they appear, generally they're going to see a face that they're familiar with on the panel. Um, I also like to try and mix uh, because I think it's, it's helpful. Uh, with the panel to not have it all be men or all women necessarily, but to have a mixture of uh, men and women, uh, and female and male judges, justices. Um, and, and so uh, those are the kind of things that, uh, that we try and do. I coordinate that with the calendar department. And we, we make sure that we, uh, we, we keep a mixed, constant mix going. Yeah. So in a given day, uh, your, your judges, a panel of judges will hear X number of cases. And then what happens next? How do you get from there to a decision? And how, how is it decided whether there is a, um, a written opinion, a memorandum, a procurium, whatever? John, what, what typically happens in our case, it's kind of, I'll give you a little peek behind the curtain, if you will. Please. Uh, yeah. Uh, what happens is on, on every, every case, um, we have an, for argument, we have an assigned judge. And that judge's job on their, the case that they're assigned to is to draft a report for the panel. And um, that report is a, usually a very thorough analysis of the points being argued, um, the facts of the case, and recommendations as to how the, uh, what they think the panel should do. Um, so that assigned judge may also have what we refer to as a preliminary report and that would be from one of our full-time staff attorneys or, or one of our um, uh, two-year program lawyers. And, and generally what they do, they handle the more um, involved records, if you will, and they do a, a thorough uh, uh, review and summary of the record uh, before the court. And then they also do the same thing in terms of analyzing the points and, and making recommendations. So there are a lot of legal eyes that go on to these, uh, these various uh, uh, um, cases that come before us. But in terms of the judge's uh, role, the judge who does the report um, will usually take the lead in the conference after the argument. Those reports, by the way, are done 
before argument. And so all of the judges have that information before them before they even go out to hear the argument. Um, they also are charged with doing their own full analysis of the briefs and records in, in combination with having that uh, report to review. Um, very often what you'll see in these cases, John, is that um, uh, I may get a, a report from one of the panel members uh, that I have, and I may disagree with the recommendation. And I could then do a note um, on that report saying, you know, I respectfully disagree with my colleague. I think this, that, or the other thing. And set forth the reasons for that and indicate that I'm going to be asking some questions of, along those lines in oral argument. And so all of that takes place before oral, oral argument, which is the reason why um, I think we're considered a pretty hot court when it comes to oral argument. The judges are all ready to go uh, on all the cases and, uh, and uh, they're fully prepared. After the argument, we go back into conference immediately. And at that point, we go through each case um, and we have discussion about all the different issues on each case and, uh, and come to a vote on, on most of the cases. Um, some cases require further analysis after a conference. And those cases are then uh, brought home by one judge who then does a further report on the case uh, and distributes it to the panel members. So <laughs> I went on a little bit long there, sorry about that, but- uh, No, I that's fine, no, that, that, that was very helpful. So with all that homework that's done prior to oral argument, the judges know at oral argument what they need and what they want from the attorneys. Right, exactly. It, it, interesting, what I found is uh, very often you'll have very uh, pointed questions about not only uh, the analysis and the briefs on various issues, but also a pulling out of the lawyer, arguing the case, of facts from the record. In other words, where in the record do you find support for this particular point that you're making? Because the lawyers, of course, know their cases better than anyone when they come to the court. We spend time on the cases, but we can't spend the kind of time the lawyers do. And the lawyers know their record as thoroughly as, as uh, anybody. So the judges in, the, in oral argument will very often be pulling out of the lawyers the specific references to the record that they think will um, uh, help amplify uh, what they believe is the ultimate conclusion that, that should be reached. And when you have a case where you have notes going back and forth amongst judges, and we have a lot of those, um, you'll find that sometimes the judges will also use oral argument to try and convince their colleagues on the court of why they're right as opposed to one of the other colleagues uh, who's taking a different position. So you'll get questions of lawyers. I find this kind of funny. You'll sometimes get questions from lawyers from a judge who's agreeing with the lawyer, trying to pull out from that lawyer supportive information to help convince the colleagues on the court that they're right. And the lawyers will sometimes be a little you know, worried, you know, how am I being trapped here with this question? with this question, which it's not that at all, of course. It's, it's uh, trying to, to pull out the information you need to, to convince your colleagues. That's interesting. So the most difficult, most challenging, most pointed questions may come from the judge who is uh, most on your side, but wants you, the attorney, to um, justify it for the other judges. Exactly. Exactly. Hmm. Now, what about dissents? What, what are your thoughts on dissents? Uh, in my experience, I don't know what the percentage is, but a, but a high percentage of your cases are unanimous. And of course, there are dissents. Um, and I think you indicated that before, even before oral argument, there, some, there can be some give and take. And you, you may not be going where the other judges are going. And maybe there's some negotiation um, before, you, before you even hear oral argument. But what, what are the circumstances that will uh, prompt you to publicly um, break with your colleagues? You know, it, it, that's, I've kind of evolved along those lines, um, John, as, as you might. You know, uh, when I first joined the court, um, um, when I disagreed with my colleagues on the panel, um, I was, I think now in retrospect, too quick to say I'm going to write a dissent. And, uh, and I, I think if you were to chart, I haven't done this, but I'm certain it's true. If you were to chart my dissents, by term, um, I think you'd find that it started off at a pretty uh, high level and then dropped off. And, uh, and I dissent, of course, now still on cases that I think are important, but um, I, I try and do it um, um, 
uh, only when I really need to, to do a dissent. You know, the, 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 the thought is this, I think, or should be this, that if you can't convince one of the members of your panel of your position, then maybe, just maybe, you ought to second guess whether or not, uh, rethink whether or not you should write a dissent in the case, especially a sole dissent. If you've got somebody with you who's supportive of you and there's a fair disagreement, then of course a dissent is appropriate and important. Um, so I think that I would probably, if I were to talk to the younger version of myself who just joined the appellate court, I would have a nice heart-to-heart -heart conversation with, that, with him about, don't be so quick to write a sole dissent in a case. Uh, leave room for the possibility that maybe, just maybe, your more experienced colleagues have gotten it right. Um, and so I don't dissent all the time. I may have disagreements um, on a case, but uh, I don't feel the need to sole dissent unless I really strongly believe that the decision is not one um, that, that um, is proper, either based upon the facts of the case or based upon the law. And, uh, and then I will, I will write a dissent and have done so, but, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's more uh, infrequent. Unlike the Court of Appeals, uh, your court has fine fact or fact finding uh, jurisdiction and interested justice uh, uh, jurisdiction. You can review the facts. The Court of Appeals can't. You can consider unpreserved issues. The Court of Appeals can't. How does that affect the dynamics of what you what you do? Well, you know, to give you one example. Um, I think when I joined the court, um, I've had, I had conversations with my colleagues about the idea of using interest of justice or interest of justice uh, powers in the, in the review of sentencing. And, uh, and it was a pretty rare thing I'm told uh, in the past, prior to me getting to the court, um, for, for our court to do those um, interest of justice reviews and, and to affect or touch or reduce sentences. Um, I think since I've been on the court, it's, it, it don't misunderstand me, this isn't because of me. I think it's just the timing of me coming on the court. Just before me getting there, there had been more of uh, an activity on the court of reviewing sentences, for example, and, and using our interest of justice uh, authority to do that. Um, and, uh, and since I've been there, I think it's, it's uh, I, I found that to be something that's um, certainly more frequent than, than what was done in the past. Um, but we, we, we take it a very we take it very seriously that that um, that authority that we're granted in the Constitution with respect to interest of justice authority um, and reviewing you know the the um, errors um, and so uh, we uh, you, you're right to say uh, does that cause an interplay does that cause a uh, a, uh, a, a conversation amongst the colleagues in conference as to when we exercise that authority. It certainly does, and and, um, and some folks are, are a little more reticent to use that authority. Others are not, and, and uh, but I find that uh, um, having that authority is an important part of the appellate court's um, uh, jurisprudence, and, and it's and it's uh, I think it makes a real impact in people's lives when we uh, in the parties' lives when we do uh, entertain those uh, entertain the use of that authority. Of course, when you do invoke your interest of justice um, power, you've uh, basically taken the Court of Appeals out of the game, right? I mean, right. then th th they, can, they can't review it, and you, you definitely have the last word there, right? Yeah, there's no question, right, exactly, exactly. And, and, uh, and so that's why, though, that's, a, it's, that's a, a primary reason, or one of the primary reasons why we're really careful about when we use that authority. And uh, and so we don't we don't uh, we don't find our way into that conversation lightly. It's it's something that comes with a lot of thought and a lot of deliberation. Hmm. Now there, there I don't know what percentage of cases get to the court of appeals, but it's a fairly small percentage as as with all of the all of the departments. And there are, as you know, a, a few ways a case can get to the court of appeals. One of them is they can get there with a grant from the appellate division. And this chief judge, and uh, pretty much every chief judge in my memory, has, uh, has uh, sent subtle and not so subtle messages that they would uh, prefer that that power be exercised judiciously. Um, what do you think of that? What, what are the circumstances when you, when you think it's appropriate for your court to basically force a case out of the Court of Appeals? Yeah, well, you know, obviously, um, we, uh, 
we hold our, the chief judge and the court of appeals in, in great respect. And, and to the extent that, that they wish or would like to kind of control the cases that they, um, that they take, um, we certainly uh, uh, respect that um, uh, uh, view from them. Um, however, the Constitution does give us authority to, to, to kind of force a, a case on, and we will, we will do that, and we have done that. Um, uh, in situations, very often when there's, a, when there's a conflict amongst the departments, of course, it can go up um, and we'll grant uh, leave to do that. Um, very often, we will look at an issue that we have struggled with on our court. And, if, and sometimes we've struggled with it over and over and we see other courts struggling with the issue. And we think it's one that's ripe for the Court of Appeals to handle. And, and uh, uh, it's not always the case um, where it, it's a final disposition, right? So sometimes it would go back to the trial court depending on how we ruled on it if we didn't grant leave to go up. So uh, we, we would like, we, we do like to, to um, uh, look hard at that. We don't do it a lot. Uh, believe me, um, but we do take a hard look at it, and uh, there are times when we have done it, and uh, and we'll continue to do it in the future when we think that it's really something, it's an issue that we're struggling with, that we think it's time for the Court of Appeals to help solve this area of law so that the litigants know what to expect, and so that we're not, you know, we have 12 judges, five sit on panels. We don't want panels disagreeing with each other from the mm -hmm. same court. And so when we get into a situation like that, very often it's one where we say, look, if we really can't come to a consistent ruling on these, we need to send this up. I see. Now, um, as I mentioned earlier, in my experience, um, the fourth department, actually all of the departments have been, are, are quite collegial. And I would imagine that um, you and the other judges have some rather spirited disagreements in conference. And how do you, as the presiding justice, prevent these disagreements among people who are um, strong-willed, intelligent, opinionated, perhaps a little stubborn, from uh, devolving into personal antagonism so they can work together? Yeah, I, I will tell you this, that I was blessed to come on to the fourth department um, uh, as an additional justice with Judge Scudder being the presiding judge. And Judge Scudder was this wonderful, calming, influence on the court. He was somebody that everybody could talk to. He could talk to everybody. And he made sure that when people were engaging with each other, they were doing it in a, in a very respectful way. That when notes went around and they were disagreeing with somebody else's report or with somebody else's note, that they were written in a very respectful way. And, uh, and I have had very rare, uh, um, very rare times that I thought it was uh, help, would have been helpful for me to go into a judge's chambers with a note um, and say, you know, this I'm one, down. <laughs> yeah, this one could have been written a little differently. And, and here's why it's important that we write it a little differently. Same argument, same position. Just you take out, the, you edit these words here, and all of a sudden, it's a much easier a note for your um, the person who's disagreeing with you to to take and absorb. Um, and so I, I've had to do that on occasion, rare occasion. The judges on our court are very respectful of each other. And so, but that's the kind of thing that a presiding judge, I think, will have to do up from time to time, just to make sure that the relationships continue and that, that you don't have real hostility on the court, which, which would be, you know, really detrimental to the, to the, uh, the joint uh, decision-making um, uh, rules that we have here, so. Let's look at that collegiality from maybe a different perspective. Invariably and inevitably, um, you will review, or you always review, and you will occasionally reverse the decisions of a trial judge. And although you have a, a wide geographic area, it's not a huge legal community. And I would imagine that you and your judges know a lot of the judges that you reverse. Is that uncomfortable to do that? You know, it's, it's funny. When I was a trial judge, I had one case in particular where I wrote a decision. And, um, and, I, and I relied upon a, a court of appeals case, which, uh, which I thought was appropriate. My case ultimately went to the fourth department, my current court. But by the time it got to the fourth department, the court of appeals had flipped its decision. And so when the fourth department reversed me, they cited the new court of appeals decision saying I was an error 
um, because you know the Court of Appeals has said this. And I thought to myself, you know, it wouldn't have taken but one sentence to say that at the time the judge wrote the decision, you know, and so I, I bring, I bring uh, uh, to this job, you know, that sensitivity uh, to our trial uh, judges. And, and so, you, we, you know, we, we certainly don't worry about, you know, we know this judge and we know that judge and we you know, feel, we'd feel bad about, you know, reversing them uh, in part or, or in full. Um, the way I look at this, and, um, and, and Judge Pickett kind of, uh, you know, talked to me about this when I first joined the court. He said, you have to think of yourself as almost like a safety net for the trial judges. The trial judges are very often under a lot of stress, big caseload, and a time constraint. They're, very, they're making decisions during a trial. Um, they're, they're ruling on, on, on jury charges, for example, in very short periods of time where, where they don't have a lot of time to, to really sit about, sit about and think about it. And so you have to think about these trial judges and the environment within which they're making decisions. Where we, on the other hand, get the full record, we get the briefs, we get to really spend time on this. And so Judge Pickett said to me, and I think he's right, we're, we need to explain to the trial judge, we're like a safety net. When things just, you can't spend the time you need to spend on a decision, and maybe it, it needs to be modified, maybe you got it wrong, we're there to help catch that so that ultimately the right decisions be made. It's not an antagonistic thing. It's not something where we're, you know, uh, um, pointing out their errors, um, uh, you know, except that to help them get to the right decision and help us get to the right decision. Are you able to... to um look at it the same way when it's going in the other direction. Um, I'm sure, I, I know your court has occasionally been reversed by the Court of Appeals. Oh yeah, all of courts. It'd, it'd, it'd be very, very unlikely if every one of your judges was vindicated every time a case went up and that every time they were in the majority, the court affirmed, every time they were in the minority, the court reversed. So what are the internal dynamics when your court gets reversed? How, how is that taken by the judges? No, the judges, I think in the very same way, you know, the, the judges, we try really hard to get the decision, to, to have it be the right decision. We know we're doing the best we can to do that. And when the Court of Appeals disagrees with us, that's why they're there. They've made a different decision. And, uh, and that's fine. And so we now then have to, to, to go back and, and, and fix what we've been doing and, and uh, look at it a different way. There, there's no... There's no sense of, uh, I haven't experienced that here on, on this court, where people complain about, you know, being reversed or they, the, the court, I think the court got it wrong. It's more a function of, okay, that's what the Court of Appeals wants in these particular cases. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you for the direction. We will take that and move forward with it. It's, uh, it's really not, uh, believe me, not any kind of, you know, um, where we get our nose out of joint because, uh, you know, the Court of Appeals has reversed us. And, and I speak to trial judges periodically, and, uh, and I'll tell them that. I'll say, you know, look, you know, we're in a chain of decision-making here, and, and sometimes we'll reverse a trial judge, and sometimes the Court of Appeals will agree with the trial judge. Mm -hmm. So we don't always get it right. And so we're doing the best we can. You're doing the best you can. Let's all do our jobs the best we can to ultimately get to the right decision and then move on. Now, as presiding justice, you have uh, a great many administrative duties as well, um, not only locally, if 22 counties is local, um, but statewide as a member of the administrative board, which of course is, is the four PJs and, and the chief judge. What are, what, what are the major issues right now statewide with the administrative board? Well, you know, this, is, uh, this little conversation we're having is going to be kind of uh, uh, held uh, for, for, and preserved, I presume, for future views by people. And, um, and so they should know that we are in the middle of the COVID pandemic. And, um, and that, um, I would say, has kind of um, been the primary focus of the administrative board um, since, you know, March. Um, and, uh, and we've been looking to, to see how can we make the court um, operate differently, more safely for the uh, parties, for the lawyers, for the judges, for the staff uh, uh, of the court system. 
um, and uh, and that has been a real challenge um, for us. And it's 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 really been what we've been doing at our administrative board meetings um, in large measure. That's that's the focus uh, because it's been such a dramatic change in the way we've done business. I bet. Now, has your court uh, fallen into any sort of a backlog because of the pandemic? Well, yeah, I, th I think that it, well, yes, it has. And, and uh, because what we've done is we've, we've had some people uh, working from home um, and we've had uh, 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 a really skeletal staff in our main office in Rochester, New York. And that slowed down the, the process of the appeals um, in, in terms of cases coming in. Now, in terms of having time to get cases that were backlogged, done and out, it's helped us in that regard. And so we have been able to address backlog cases um, more efficiently. But the, the problem is that we're, we're, there's now a pent up number of cases and, and, and uh, we're expecting that there's gonna be a bit of a backlog going forward. But uh, everybody's committed to making sure that we continue to operate, we continue to get cases uh, resolved and, and uh, decisions out. And uh, to that extent, it's been um, the stream of work has, uh, in terms of us working, not the same volumes necessarily, but us working has been continuous. Just a couple more questions, and then I'll, then I'll, then I'll, then I'll let you get back to your backlog. Uh, <laughs> what, what, this will put you on the spot a little bit. What do you wish the other branches of government, the executive and legislative branches, better understood about the judicial branch? You know, as an industry, question, uh, John, I would say this, that, that when we're deciding a case, we're deciding it based upon the Constitution, based upon the statute, based upon the facts of that particular case, primarily. And so the idea that um, other branches of gov government may try to extrapolate um, what we may do on a future case, of course, that's important. Stare decisis is important, but you can get a little bit too in the weeds on those things. Facts of the cases as they come to us change slightly, and if they change slightly, that will sometimes change the outcome of the case. And so I think they need to understand that, that, the, that we're ruling on the case before us. Um, and uh, we're doing so with, with an effort to try and give some guidance uh, to, to, the, to the lawyers and to the parties going forward. But also keep in mind, you know, facts of these cases change, and sometimes subtle changes in facts will result in different decisions. Now, I've asked this question of the other presiding justices as well, and I want to uh, pose it to you and see if your answer is similar to what they are. But imagine there is an attorney about to argue before the fourth department for the first time. What, 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 what's your advice? What, what should they do and what should they not do? Yeah, I, I think that, um, well, first of all, I wouldn't at all, um, I, I would find it um, worthwhile uh, for a lawyer, a new lawyer, to say, Your Honors, may it please the court, I would just like you to know this is the first time I've appeared before this court or before any appellate court, um, and then begin their argument. In other words, let us know that you're not a seasoned appellate lawyer. That's helpful for the judges. You know, we're human beings. We've been there for our first time also, and, uh, and it might be helpful to us to know that. Um, so I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't hesitate to do that. But in terms of somebody who's been practicing on a regular basis, um, uh, the kind of uh, some of the things that, that I think are important. One, I think be succinct and, and hit your strongest points right off the bat as quick as you can. Um, I think that's important. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean you go point by point one, point two, point three. Um, sometimes you know you thought point one was the strongest until you got to reply brief, and now you think maybe point two is the strongest. Go to point two. Um, don't feel like you need to argue if you've got seven or eight points in your brief. Don't argue all of them. Don't try to argue all of them. It's just not efficient. Um, you can submit on the brief with respect to those other points. Um, I, I also think it's very important, and sometimes nervousness results in this happening, but sometimes lawyers will talk on top of judges' questions. They'll be anticipating what the question is, and before it's asked completely, they will start answering. I don't think that that's helpful. The judge would like to get their question out typically before you start answering. I think that's important. And, uh, and I also think uh, that when the, when the judge is asking a question, listen to the question and answer the question as best you can. In other words, 
don't listen to the question and then just start talking about some of the point in your brief that, that uh, you think is important because you will lose points with the whole panel if you're not responding to, to questions. And lastly, I, I think, and I found this uh, to be very, um, and I didn't do this as a lawyer um, and, and probably should have, um, I find sometimes the most persuasive argument by a lawyer when being challenged on one of their points that they, they know is not maybe their strongest point. If they can not concede the point, but they concede that maybe it's not their strongest point in the brief when they're being questioned about it and, and then answer the question, but then move off into their strongest point in the brief. I find, I find that advocacy to be pretty effective. In other words, somewhat acknowledging that you know that this points in your brief, it had to be raised, but it's not the strongest point in your brief, but here is the strongest point in my brief, and this is why I want to go back at that. So I, that, that would be some of the tips I would give uh, um, a lawyer coming to argue before a court. Well, that's great advice. And Judge, thank you so much for your time, and uh, I do appreciate it, and very much appreciate the work you do in my home region, the western part of the state. John, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you today.